the grace that we we are able to enjoy, particularly when there's food involved. I, yeah, I, I learned about name all of the folks that I've never heard of before. It was a pretty good lesson. And the Sunday school room was really well decorated. Uh, that, uh, the uh, room 26, where y'all can go and buy the rest of that stuff. So that uh, a lot of you didn't bring it home. <laughs> but I got them to know it really well. And uh, I'll be glad to uh, see it in y'all's house. <laughs> or give it to somebody you don't like. Uh, <laughs> or even if they, you do like them. They may not like you afterwards. But, uh, and you uh, the, the Christmas room, you can uh, uh, clean that out uh, after church day is the last opportunity. Hallelujah. Um, in other announcements, uh, the blood roundup is coming up. You want to say something special? Because as you get rid of, I hate to say this, don't, don't get me afraid, two full cups of blood, your body kicks in to start producing new fresh. Any man or postmenopausal woman who donates at least three times a year will cut your risk of heart attack by 60%. If that isn't staying healthy, I don't know what is. I donate every two months, and I know a lot of you do. I think that's a part of my being healthy. And yet, blood donations are down more than 20%. But people still need it. You can help somebody by coming and donating next weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we always give prizes. Everybody's name goes in the drawing. In past years, not every single person has gotten a prize. But I got more prizes this year given to the Roundup than I've ever had. And I know everybody's going to get a prize. So please, if you come for the prize, I know you're not doing that really. I know you're coming to help. So please, come to the Roundup next weekend at the Freshman Campus Auditorium. We'll be there about 7. I won't be able to take you until about 8.30, but that's all right. Come, and I won't be in church next week, so I'll see you the week after and be able to thank you for coming. And you get a free band-aid. <laughs> in your bulletin that uh, you can read in your spare time. I include tomorrow night the Methodist Men's Fellowship meets here and uh, fellowship, fellowship Hall at 6.30 and Dowling said this is a really special gathering this month in November, and we invite the ladies to come as well. You ladies who've been cooking all the stuff for your husbands anyway are perfectly welcome to come and actually eat some of it uh, this time. 
So tomorrow night, 6.30 in the fellowship hall. Uh, I think I covered the announcements. So, line can come and lead us in singing. Page 139 in your hymnal. You all need to come to the Christmas room after church and buy some of that stuff. Amen. <laughs>
come to you this morning rejoicing in your name, rejoicing in the gifts that you give us that we so often enjoy when we're not just taking them for granted. We thank you most for sending your son, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah that you promised from the beginning of time to come and to show all of mankind what you and your love is really like. Thank you for making us able to hear the words of Christ, to read the word of Christ in scripture every day. Lord, thank you for letting us to know him as he fills our lives with your glory. Lord, we praise you in his glory. We thank you for all that you've given us. And Lord, when we come to you and we concentrate on you and your glory, we cannot help but to wonder at your greatness in all that you have done all that you've done in creating this universe, in creating this world, in ordering in your will all that you do. Lord, we thank you for your greatness. As we look in upon ourselves, we also can't help because of the world we live in to bring our concerns forward to you. Lord, many of us here ourselves need your healing, need your comfort, We all know and are now thinking of those who are ailing in our families, in our neighborhood, throughout all the world. Those who are ailing, those who are hurting, those who need your touch, and those who need your salvation that only you can provide. <clears throat> we see listed in our book the names of members of this family who are recuperating, who are at home, who are undergoing treatment or at convalescent centers, private care, hospice, those who are doing their best to get better. And Lord, we know that it is through you that healing truly comes. And we ask this morning for your healing. We ask your blessings on this body of believers who come to meet and to worship you this morning, to praise your name, to hear your word, and to worship you and you alone. Together, we gather in prayer, saying together that prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are so beautiful to me. You are so beautiful to me. Like the lilies in the valley, and peaks of glow with snow. You are so beautiful to me. You are so beautiful to me. You are so beautiful to me. You're holding hands with Jesus. She's smiling down on me. You are so beautiful to me.
by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant? When I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and believe that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to ask and you do not need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus answered, that the time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to your own house, to your own home. You will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That ends the 16th chapter. May God add a blessing for reading God's holy word. This is one of the, a part of one of the longest discourses by Jesus in scripture. Chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 all take place in the upper room after the Last Supper. We've been following through Mark, Jesus' journey in that gospel, right up until this same point. But I switched over to John for this week and next week because John just has this unique glimpse into these last hours. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we go from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. Just bang, bang. In John's Gospel, Jesus spends a tremendous amount of time talking to his disciples. And 
he tells them repeatedly that he's going away. They don't get it. It goes right over their head. They don't understand. I wish that I could read this gospel not knowing what is to come. To be able to read the story as, as for the first time. Do y'all have any books that you read and reread wanting to recapture the, the moment of discovery and and maybe joy in the book and you already know it's coming. You you can sometimes almost speak the words before the characters do because you know what's happening. I cannot remember a time when I didn't understand what Jesus said when he told the disciples, in a little while you will see me no more, then after a little while you will see me. We all know what that sequence of events is. Jesus dies and is raised again. Their grief will turn to joy. It all makes perfect sense to us. And I just wish sometimes that, that I could unring that bell, that I could somehow go back and, and have the anticipation that is built into these verses. Now, John wrote them after the crucifixion and resurrection. He knew what was coming. But he wrote them for people who didn't know, who could hear the story for the first time. Can you remember a time before you knew Jesus was raised from the dead. I have tried to dial back far enough in my memory to a time, maybe when I was a little child, when I wouldn't have understood what these words meant. But I can't get back far enough. I've always known Easter morning from the time I was a little child I knew that Jesus was alive I didn't always know Jesus as my Savior but I always knew that Jesus was alive and so I've never been able to read these words and have that confusion that the disciples have. What does he mean? What is he talking about? And so Jesus spends some time trying to help them understand. <coughs> he knows that they want to ask him, so he answers their question. In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. It's the same thing all over again. What's he talking about? They wonder. Well, we know. We know. But for a few minutes, just suspend your knowledge. And walk with the disciples. In this time of not understanding, of questioning. In verse 20, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. The crowd shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Kill 
together. And people mocked and jeered as Jesus hung upon the cross. And though the Gospels do not say so, I am confident that some cheered when he died. Hearts of the disciples were broken. We've given up everything. We've done everything. How could he leave us? How could he die? There were tears of sorrow. Among those disciples. Now Jesus had told them over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> the sequence of events that were going to happen. But they didn't, they didn't get it. And if we're honest, there are times when we've been in the midst of a situation that we didn't understand until after the fact. that proverbial light bulb didn't go off for them. And, and I think I understand. They were living in the moment. They were walking this journey literally with Jesus. They were doing their best to keep up with him. To follow him into the paths of danger. Thomas, in this same Gospel of John, as Jesus declares that he's going to Jerusalem, Thomas says, well, let us go with him also that we might die with him. The authorities would readily have gathered up the disciples right along with Jesus. But they were like roaches when the light comes on. They scattered. In chapter 18, Jesus says, to let these men go. Let them go. You come for me, take me. But let them go. And so, they scattered and ran. As Jesus predicted, they would. while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. That is the good news of the gospel. Jesus is alive. He died that we might have life. And we need to live that life in the fullness of the knowledge that we have been forgiven. And it's good news. Jesus says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish 
because her joy that a child is born in the world. I said for years, years before I was ever married, if women could remember the pain of childbirth, everyone would be an only child. <laughs> I said that right up until my first child was born, and Joy pointed her finger at me. I think I actually said it in the <laughs> delivery room. Not one of my finer moments. She pointed her finger at me and she said, I will never forget the pain of having this child. I went almost two years without ever repeating again that everyone would be the only child if women could remember the pain of childbirth. Jesus said it first. If I had just been clued in, I could have said what Jesus said. <clears throat> wouldn't have helped me. To my undying joy, as the first pain of induced labor hit joy, she cried out and she said, oh, I forgot how much it hurt. <laughs> not, again, not one of my final moments. I didn't say anything at the moment. I didn't even do that. I just went. I can tell the joke again. <laughs> Jesus says, when you've got that child to hold, you forget all about the pain. And we think we retain the pain, but we retain the memory of the pain, which is not the same thing. Time really does heal our wounds. And so Jesus repeats for them again. Again, these are to people who don't get it, who don't understand, who are trying to, to come up to speed with what's going on. They know there is tremendous danger, tremendous risk to Jesus and themselves in this time. But in the midst of it, they just can't quite keep up with what's happening. So now is your time to breathe, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. And your joy will be complete. These words were spoken to Jesus' disciples. But we are the inheritors of these words. We are encouraged to ask in Jesus' name that our joy may be complete. Most of us hear these words, and very much like the disciples who heard them, we just let them go over our heads, forgetting that Jesus wants us to ask. will be given you, seek, and you will find, knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. 
Jesus says these words over and over again in different ways, in different places, at different times. <coughs> and still, we don't ask until we're in the midst of trouble. I have always appreciated the phrase, as long as there are tests in school, there will be prayer in school. <laughs> Those emergency prayers, oh Lord, help me with the information I didn't learn ahead of time, are unfortunately rarely answered. Lord, Bring back to my memory that which I've studied. That, that prayer can be answered, but fill in the gap <laughs> doesn't really work. We're on a journey full of ups and downs. <laughs> and through it all, God is with us. And we've got Turn to him. Jesus promises that he won't speak figuratively anymore. One of the things that's missing from the Gospels that I would give almost anything to have are the discussions Jesus had in the upper room with the disciples after his resurrection. Those discussions during those next 40 days when he revealed to them everything. When he opened the scriptures to them, walking on the road to Emmaus, it says that Jesus opened the scriptures to them and they understood. And it's like, what did he say? What were the words? We'll have to wait till we one day sit at his feet to know the answers to so many questions. But Jesus assures the disciples that God the Father loves them. Not just through Jesus, but loves them because they have believed in Jesus. You are loved by the Father. Before you ever believe, but certainly after you have believed. I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. And then the disciples say, Well, now, now we understand what you're saying. This makes us believe that you came from God. One of my favorite lines in the gospel You believe at last. It's got an exclamation point after it. You believe at last. This is the gospel that has the phrase, many other things Jesus did in the sight of his disciples. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that believing you might have life in his name. You believe at last. You finally get it. But the time is coming and has come when you will be scattered each to his own house. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone for my Father is with me. They were so close comprehending and yet so far from understanding. When Jesus was arrested just a few verses after these they all scattered and ran. Peter hung back at a distance. John was still there at the cross. 
but initially everybody ran. Then verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That is something we can hold on to. We are in the world. We are in Christ. There's an overlap of those things. When we're in Christ, we're not outside the world. Not yet. But the more we're in Christ, the less the troubles of the world will trouble us. Because Jesus has overcome the world. Take heart. I have overcome before he died, he has already declared, I have overcome the world. In another place, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me. I have overcome the world. Take heart. Be encouraged. That's what take heart means. Be encouraged. Jesus has overcome the world and we are in him. Sickness, death, sorrow, may be with us for a season. Take heart, be encouraged. Jesus has overcome the world. That is the good news. We're closing in on the end of the Christian year. Next Sunday is the end of the Christian year. And we start the cycle all over again with Advent. you have overcome. Lord, help us to bear up under the trials and tribulations of life. Lord, may we never lose heart. Abide with us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my favorite hymns, 163, Ask Me What Great Thing I Know. I feel like I can sing this every single week. But I won't thank y'all. <laughs>
Now may the love of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep us all now and forevermore. Amen.